സോ കെ ടി പി എ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് നമ്മുടെ ഇപ്പോൾ ഓൾറെഡി അറിയാം ഒരുപാട് ആൾക്കാർക്ക് അറിയാമായിരിക്കും നമ്മുടെ കേരളത്തില് റിസർച്ച് ചെയ്യാൻ ഗവേഷണം ചെയ്യാൻ വേണ്ടി പല ബുദ്ധിമുട്ടുകളുണ്ട് പല അത് താല്പര്യമുള്ള ആൾക്കാർക്ക് ഗവേഷണം ചെയ്യാനും തുടരാനും ഒക്കെയുള്ള ഒരു അറ്റ്മോസ്ഫിയർ കേരളത്തിൽ ഇല്ല എന്ന് നമുക്കറിയാം അങ്ങനെ മനസ്സിലാക്കി കൊണ്ടുള്ള കുറച്ച് റിസർച്ചിൽ താല്പര്യമുള്ള ആക്റ്റീവായിട്ട് റിസർച്ച് ചെയ്യുന്ന കുറച്ച് പേര് ചേർന്ന് തുടങ്ങിയിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു ഇനീഷ്യേറ്റീവാണ് കേരള തിയറട്ടിക്കൽ ഫിസിക്സ് ഇനീഷ്യേറ്റീവ് എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് അതിൽ പല ഉദ്ദേശ ലക്ഷ്യങ്ങളും ഉണ്ട് കേരളത്തില് ഇത്തരത്തിൽ ഗവേഷണത്തിന് പറ്റിയ അറ്റ്മോസ്ഫിയർ ഉണ്ടാക്കുക എന്നുള്ളതാണ് അതിന്റെ ഒരു പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ലക്ഷ്യം അതിന്റെ ഭാഗമായിട്ട് നമ്മൾ പല ലെക്ചർ സീരീസുകളും ട്രെയിനിങ് പ്രോഗ്രാമുകളും വർക്ക്ഷോപ്പുകളൊക്കെ നടത്താൻ ആലോചിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് നടത്തിക്കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് പ്രധാനപ്പെട്ട ഒരു പ്രോഗ്രാം ആർട്ട് എന്ന് പറയുന്ന ആക്റ്റീവ് റിസർച്ച് ട്രെയിനിങ് പ്രോഗ്രാം എന്നുള്ള ഒരു ട്രെയിനിങ് പ്രോഗ്രാം ആണ് എം എസ് സി സ്റ്റുഡൻസിന് വേണ്ടിയിട്ടുള്ള അതിന്റെ അഡ്വർടൈസ്മെന്റ് അതിന്റെ സെക്കൻഡ് ഫേസ് ഓൾറെഡി ഒരു വർഷം നമ്മൾ അത് കഴിഞ്ഞു അതിന്റെ റിസർച്ചുകൾ അതിന്റെ പ്രോജക്ടുകൾ കംപ്ലീറ്റ് ആയി കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നു ഇരുപത് പേരോളം സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് അതിന്റെ അതിൽ വർക്ക് ചെയ്യുന്നുണ്ട് പ്രൊജക്ടുകളിൽ വിവിധ പ്രൊജക്ടുകളിൽ അപ്പോ അടുത്ത ഫേസ് ഇപ്പൊ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ചെയ്തിട്ടുണ്ട് അതിന്റെ അഡ്വർടൈസ്മെന്റ് വന്നിട്ടുണ്ട് മാർച്ച് ഫൈവ് ആണ് ഡെഡ് ലൈൻ അപ്പൊ താല്പര്യമുള്ളവർ അതിൽ അപ്ലൈ ചെയ്യണം എം എസ് സി ഫസ്റ്റ് ഇയറിൽ ഇപ്പൊ ചെയ്യുന്ന ആൾക്കാരാണ് അപ്ലൈ ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുന്നത് അപ്പോ അതിന്റെ ഒരു അഡ്വാൻറ്റേജ് നിങ്ങൾ എടുക്കണം ആ എം എസ് സി ഫസ്റ്റ് ഇയറിൽ ഫസ്റ്റ് ഇയർ പഠിക്കുന്ന സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് ഈ ഒരു പാർട്ടിസിപ്പന്റ് ലിസ്റ്റിൽ ഉണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അപ്പൊ അതാണ് ഒരു പ്രോഗ്രാം അതിന്റെ ഭാഗമായിട്ട് തന്നെ പല ആക്റ്റീവ് ട്രെയിനിങ് പരിപാടികൾ അതായത് ലെക്ചർ സീരീസുകൾ മറ്റു ടോക്കുകളൊക്കെ സംഘടിപ്പിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് അതിന്റെ ഭാഗമായിട്ടാണ് ഇന്ന് ഇങ്ങനെ ഒരു ടോക്ക് നടക്കുന്നത് ഓക്കെ അത്രയാണ് കെ ടി പി എ കുറിച്ച് പറയാനുള്ളത് കൂടുതൽ കാര്യങ്ങൾ കെ ടി പി എയുടെ വെബ്സൈറ്റുകളിൽ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ലഭ്യമാണ് കൂടുതൽ കാര്യങ്ങൾ ചെയ്യാൻ ഭാവിയിൽ കൂടുതൽ കാര്യങ്ങൾ ചെയ്ത് കേരളത്തിൽ നല്ലൊരു റിസർച്ച് അറ്റ്മോസ്ഫിയർ ഉണ്ടാക്കിയെടുക്കുക എന്നുള്ളതാണ് നമ്മുടെ ലക്ഷ്യം അതിനു വേണ്ടിയാണ് നമ്മൾ പ്രവർത്തിക്കുന്നത് ഓക്കെ അപ്പൊ നമുക്ക് ഇന്നത്തെ ടോക്കിലേക്ക് വരാം കാർത്തിക് നമ്മുടെ ഇന്നത്തെ സ്പീക്കറെ ഇൻട്രൊഡ്യൂസ് ചെയ്യുന്നതായിരിക്കും കാർത്തിക് ഓവർ ടു യു ഓക്കെ താങ്ക് യു രതുൽ ഇറ്റ്സ് മൈ പ്ലസ് ടു ഇൻട്രൊഡ്യൂസ് ഡോക്ടർ കിഞ്ചൽ ലോജൻ ഐ തിങ്ക് ഐ ലോൺ കിഞ്ചൽ ഫ്രം ടു തൗസൻഡ് ഫിഫ്റ്റീൻ വെൻ ഐ വാസ് ഇൻ മൈ ഫസ്റ്റ് ഇയർ ഓർ സെക്കൻഡ് ഇയർ ഓഫ് പി എസ് ഡി ആൻഡ് then uh, kinjal was a post of their fairly well correctly and okay so uh, kinjal completed his phd in uh, 2013 from the afr under the guidance of professor uh, tp singh and then he joined as a post doc at ayuka and worked there for about 3 years under professor tanu patnabhan and uh, later he was a post doc at isa juandrum for about 10 year and then in uh, i think 2016 he joined isa mohali as an inspire faculty uh, fellow uh, currently he is an assistant professor in the department of physical sciences uh, at isa mohali uh, kinjal works on a wide uh, range of areas such as uh, general relativity black holes uh, early universe and uh, several aspects of theoretical high energy physics Uh, i am uh, glad to inform you that very recently in in uh, the completion of his excellent contributions he has conferred the prestigious uh, nrsm young researcher uh, grant by the indian association for uh, general relativity and gravitation and uh, i have been told by different sources that in addition to being a very good researcher he is also uh, an excellent teacher uh, so yeah it is my request to the students therefore you know to fully make use of this opportunity by listening to him carefully and asking him questions which is even more important so uh, without further ado let me request uh, kinjal to talk about uh, the antru tunnel echoes of uh, atom in slow form uh, slow form yeah kinjal please thank you thank you kartik and uh, also with, thank you to ktpi team for inviting me for this and uh, it's really nice initiative which is taking up and i'm really glad that i could be a part of it in some way and i look forward to future events of this sort i had briefly stayed in kerala as kartik was pointed out and it was one of my memorable uh, life a uh, part of my life and therefore it, i was very happy to contribute to anything which is going on into this kind of student 
friendly symposium. Okay, so I also see many uh, friends and known faces and hello to everyone. So today I'm going to talk about a work which uh, we recently put, not very recently, but say, let's say six or eight months old. And it is regarding the UNRU effect. Uh, so uh, just before I begin the talk, I am keeping the talk uh, into a more kind of uh, storytelling way rather than into a deep mathematical structure which it offers. And I, in preparation of my talk, I was aiming at a master's level student. So I'm assuming very brief knowledge of quantum field theory, even if it is not there, I will try to introduce. But if you want to be more elaborate than that, please alert me at time whenever uh, you want to get more details. Otherwise, you may feel that some details are more sketchy in nature and it is rather building on, on concepts on, rather than on um, serious mathematical calculations in this uh, in this discussion for today. But at any stage, if you are interested in knowing more about the detailed mathematics hiding behind, you let me know and or you get in touch with me. We will have uh, discussions on that as well. So, okay, so with this, uh, let me try to share it in full screen mode and please let me know if it is fine. This is all right? Yeah, it looks fine. Okay, okay. Okay, so yeah, so today what we will discuss is uh, the UNRU tunnel. I hope uh, you might have heard about the UNRU effect in one way or another. Uh, if not, we will see what it is and what we are trying to do with it. And the subtitle of the talk tells the echoes of an atom under slow fall. So it's some sort of tunnel which we will be talking about and we will put an atom and let it fall through it with not so high kind of acceleration as it is envisaged in Monroe effect directly calculated. And then we'll see if there is anything interesting about it. And I hope by the end of the talk, I'll be able to convince you in some form that it might be worth investigating into in more details, theoretically, as well as experimentally, possibly. So, so the story which we are chasing in this discussion today is, uh, just a second, let me first, just hiding my view, so let me share also. Okay, so the story which we are trying to chase in today's discussion is this famous statement by William Unru, which is roughly now 50 years old that a vacuum state of inertial frame appears to be filled with particle and more particularly filled with particles in thermal distribution as seen from an accelerated frame. So this is the crux of the Unruh effect which we are talking of, we will be talking about. And this appears in many form across various kinds of systems which appear in gravity, accelerating frames, quantum field theory, incurred space times and whatnot. So this, this particular fact gets reflected and realized in some form or another in uh, across various conditions like Hawking radiation, particle creation in early universe. In some sort, you can think about uh, particle creation from electric field also in some realization of that itself. We will see in some, some sketchy details what does it exactly mean. The references for today's discussion you want to find uh, would be contained mostly from the first reference, which is an excellent review on the Unruh effect and its application by Crispino, Higuchi, and Massas. And this is a review of modern physics thing where it lists various attempts to see the Unruh effect in experimental realizations and what are the problems which plague these kind of efforts. We will see why the prediction on one side is very fascinating while the experimental realization or observing this is very problematic or very challenging. And therefore, people try to come up with different different schemes of doing so. And most of them are very limited in its appeal or even realization. And then in the later part of this talk, we will try to discuss the work, which is the central theme of today's talk, is a work which I did with uh, Jafino, who was a postdoc at Aisha uh, Mohali at a few, till few months back. And now he is at MIT pursuing this idea in uh, another- Kinjalik? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Jafino is actually among the participants. He has joined. Ah, okay, okay. I had I just there. sent him. So I was okay. Hi, Jafino. So I can yeah, you can catch Jafino as well. Uh, whenever you have any doubt and anything, you can catch Jafino or me 
to get more details about it. So, uh, but uh, as I said in the beginning, I will be rather sketchy towards the ideas in this talk rather than uh, accurate mathematical structure, which I will skip over for most of the time. But if you are interested, you let me know and we will discuss it. Okay. So, <clears throat> to start with, uh, the, the statement which we just saw from Unru that the vacuum of the inertial frame appears to be thermally populated as seen from the accelerating frame. So that brings to us to the idea of understanding vacuum and particles. So the natural question to ask would be, what is vacuum? If you ask this question and the response to that would be, vacuum would be an absence of particles in terms of uh, Theoretical structure, it would be devoid of any particles or anything into the structure. The vacuum state of a field theory, if you are uh, slightly familiar with quantum field theory, the free field theory's ground state would be dubbed as a vacuum of the theory. Interacting field theory's ground state would be the ground state, but the free field theory's ground state would be the vacuum. So the notion of vacuum is rather the is a antithesis of a definition which is absence of any particle so that naturally brings us to the definition the questioning of what is then a particle first we have to define a particle and then the absence of a particle would be de declared as a vacuum that is the naive way of thinking about it so when you ask what is a particle the answer to this would be depending upon whom you are asking suppose you are asking a person which is more inclined classically that person might try to answer you in the way of classical uh, setting it would be declared as a point in configuration or a phase space so xx dot in configuration space or in phase space xp anything which occupies one dot in these spaces would be declared a particle however uh, when we go to quantum mechanical setups so persons inclined more towards quantum mechanics would be Trying, would try to invoke uncertainty principle and it will be impossible to declare one point in phase space because uncertainty relation does not allow to you to go beyond some specific cell size. So that classical definition would come under scrutiny and uh, in standard quantum mechanics and uh, or even relativistic quantum mechanics or quantum field theory if you are partly trained in, you would realize that the notion of particles, free particles is captured by plane waves. The plane waves are supposed to be the structure of particles and depending upon its spin and whatnot, the, there, is, there are various field theoretical sophistication you can attach it to. For example, it would be a reducible representation of a point carry group or whatnot, but that virtually tells about the spin, spinorial structure of the particle. But the essence of a free particle, which has a good dispersion relation, would be a plane wave structure. So quantum mechanically, which we believe is a fundamental description of a particle, a plane wave is a, uh, is a thing which would be declared a particle. Then the next question to ask would be, is there a general consensus amongst different frames regarding what is a particle or even who is a particle? So in order to answer that, I will just briefly one give one page working summary of quantum field theory if you are not familiar with it. Please let me know if uh, everyone here is familiar with that or uh, if any of the uh, organizers can tell me if I can skip over it or uh, uh, Krishna or Kinjal, I, I guess yeah you, you should go through it because uh, like MS okay, students okay. I don't think they all study quantum field theory. Okay, okay fine. So I am just giving you a very brief working summary working summary for the talk that means a some structure of quantum field theory which we will take up and what is essential for today's discussion i'm just listing that so i'm for the sake of simplicity and convenience i'm going to talk about a field theory quantum field theory a field is, of course is set of degrees of freedom defined across space and time everywhere and they are quantum mechanical in nature that means there are operators so operators defined at each location of space and time every event there is some operator and to be more uh, to be uh, having a most simplistic settings i am going to talk about a massless scalar field a scalar field means there is no tensorial structure it is not evolving changing from frame to frame it does not transform like a vector or tensor it is just a scalar and it is massless so it does not have any 
mass in it. For example, uh, a scalar analog of a photon. Photon is a massless field, but it is a tensorial field. Actually, vector field mu's are the fields you quantize. But think of a scalar version of that. A scalar field devoid of any tensorial structure and massless. You can put in mass and uh, tensorial structure, everything. Most of the story will go through exactly as we discussed. And other structures like mass and uh, tensorial structure will slightly modify quantitative things, but the qualitative picture remains the same. So I'm being most sort of general or most sort, sort of simplistic to drive home the message which we want to carry. So if you have done relativistic quantum mechanics, first of all, quantum mechanics, as we know on the face of it, Schrodinger equation is not a relativistic equation. It does not transform relativistically in a good way because T and X are on different footing. Right, left hand side, D psi upon DT is single time derivative. Right hand side is double time, uh, space derivative. So space times are behaving in different ways. If you go relativistic, try to do relativistic quantum mechanics, you are led to something called the Klein-Gordon equation, which is double derivative of time as well as double derivative of space. So I have written the first equation, minus del T square of pi plus del X square of pi is equal to zero, is an equation satisfied by a massless scalar field uh, in flat space time, in Minkowski space time. So this is the, the Klein-Gordon equation. If you have mass term, it will add up to it. If there is potential, it will add up to it. But I'm keeping it most simple by removing the mass term and the potential term. So this is a simple enough equation, the free Klein-Gordon equation. What you do, we try to go solve this equation not in position space, but we will jump to the Fourier space. So I transform phi tx as phi kt is Fourier transform. Phi kt is a variable which we want to know. Once we know phi kt, its Fourier transform gives me phi tx. If the spatial description of field scalar field phi, uh, remember these phi's and other things in quantum field theory will become an operator. It is not uh, t and x are the points about which I am talking about. Phi will tell me what is the operator at that point I'm going to talk about. So phi tx is a Fourier transform of another operator phi kt. And if I put this Fourier transformed version of phi tx in the Klein-Gordon equation, the first equation, I get for each k, there is an equation phi k double dot plus omega k square phi k is equal to zero. This is just simple putting of the second equation into the first. And then you see that for individual k satisfies satisfy this equation, which is nothing but a harmonic oscillator structure. So you see, we transform from position space to Fourier space and magic happens that the Fourier space variable starts satisfying the harmonic os uh, oscillators equations of motion. So that means what we were calling as a field in free space is a bunch of collection of harmonic oscillator in Fourier space. Okay. So given one field, you can talk about phi tx or you can talk about a bunch of phi k, phi k1, k2, k3, all possible k's and all of them are free oscillators. So this problem of quantizing the quantum field equation number one becomes the problem of quantizing infinite number of oscillators, which is one oscillator for each k by case. And oscillator solutions we all are familiar with in quantum mechanics. Just like in position space, if my x, uh, if my x is a uh, variable which satisfies x double dot plus omega k square x is equal to zero, I know x can be written in terms of a k plus a k dagger. If I want to time evolve further, the a k and a k dagger are supposed to time evolve in some way in Heisenberg picture. So x of t therefore becomes a k, the x of t in harmonic oscillator becomes a times e to the power i omega t plus a dagger times e to the power minus i omega t. That is how the Heisenberg picture would tell you how position operator evolves in harmonic oscillator. And phi k behave exactly like the x operator, position operator. So phi k will do the corresponding business for each k. So phi k will have a a and a dagger for each k value, which we are calling a k and a k dagger. Their role is the same as the role of A and A dagger in harmonic oscillator to create or annihilate particles. And therefore, phi k can be written in analogy to the position variable this in this way, A k dagger e to the power i omega t plus its Hermitian counterpart. Once you substitute this phi k in the Fourier transform version of the field phi tx, you get that this phi operator itself 
the second equation and then compare it with the last equation. It becomes D3K times an annihilation operator AK and then e to the power i omega t and e to the power i kx together can be clubbed together and collectively them uh, collectively i am calling them as uk now you see that this uk or its hermitian conjugate is appearing in the next terms this uk is nothing but the definition of a plane wave which we came across if you solve the plane wave equation or the wave equation of uh, massless wave is supposed to satisfy that is the plane wave this uk is nothing but a plane wave all right, and this plane wave is a notion of a particle in standard quantum mechanics. So the mode functions U K are the no notion of particles in quantum field theory. A K creates or destroys particles for you, just like harmonic oscillator A and A dagger will do at each mode number. Wave mode number one, wave num mode number two, K one, K two, K three. There are creation and annihilation operators which will do so. So A K dagger A K will count the number of particles. In a particular mode k, ak will destroy the number of particles in mode k by one. Ak dagger will create a particle in mode number k by one. So this is the structure in quantum field theory which goes through. Now, one important thing about this plane wave is if you look at the structure of the plane wave, this transforms in a relativistic consistent way under Lorentz transformation. By that I mean the plane wave remains a plane wave if I transform under Lorentz transformation or if I move from one inertial frame to another inertial frame. So look at the second equation in this thing. I omega t minus k dot x can be written as I k central dot and x. k central dot x is the, the space, the uh, dot product in space time, which I have written in the next line. It is eta mu nu k mu x mu. So this is relativistically, uh, by I say relativistically, special relativistically invariant inner product. Eta mu nu k mu x mu. This is a Lorentz invariant object. So when I do a Lorentz transformation and go to a new frame, then k dot x goes to k prime dot x prime. The only thing is that in the uh, whatever k dot x was, it form remains the same. Actually, the value also remains the same because it's a scalar. But its form is invariant and therefore e, e to the power i omega t minus k dot x goes to e to the power i omega prime t prime minus k prime x prime. Which is to say the plane wave remains plane waves. That is, in other words, the particles remains particle if you transform inertially, if you transform in a Lorentz uh, through a Lorentz transformation. A Lorentz transformation I am writing as x prime is equal to lambda x over the arrow if you were you can see. So this is the statement that the mode function, which we call particle, does not change if you do inertial transformation. However, this is about the mode function, but in quantum mechanics, the essence of or the concept of how many particles are there is captured not by these mode functions, but by the states. For example, vacuum would be state without any particle. One K naught, for example, in this uh, kit I have written is a single particle state with one particle in the mode K naught. Two K naught is a double particle state. Two particles are put in the K naught mode. The next item, one K naught, one K naught primed is also a two particle state, but there, there are two particles, one each at two different mode values, K naught and K naught primed. So therefore there can be infinite number of such possibilities and all of these constitute something called a box space. Okay, the set of collections of all possible particle configurations is called a Fox space in this. Okay, so this basis 0, 1k0, 2k0, 1k0, 1k0 prime and those kind of things remains invariant under inertial transformation. So number of particles count does not change if you transform inertially. But how to count the number of particles in a particular state? What operator exactly? counts the number of particles. AK dagger AK, of course, gives me the number of particles, but operationally, how do I generate AK dagger AK? Because I have an access to field phi. How to do a measurement such that AK dagger AK comes out naturally? How to take, take out AK dagger AK from the field? What do I do to the field so that I get a glimpse of AK dagger AK? For instance, Field expectations are not sensitive to the number count 
the how many particles in the field mostly not every time it is true but in the basis elements which i am talking about this statement is true that if i take the expectation of phi in the vacuum state this will give you a number zero it will tell you it is zero expectation of phi across the ground state is zero but it is also zero for 1k naught okay it is also zero for 2k naught and what for any particle basis element this expectation is zero so therefore obviously field expectation is not related to ak dagger ak it is not going to count particles for you because it does not see any difference between ground state or excited state however the second quadratic operators like correlators phi x phi y because phi if you remember the way we had written uh, the if the way uh, we had written the field it was ak times uk plus ak dagger time uk star each phi comes with one ak so in order to generate ak dagger ak i need at least two of them so correlators of phi is the natural choice of going towards counting ak dagger ak so field correlators in some way are hiding the information of ak dagger ak that is our expectation so once I look for whether these correlators are sensitive to presence of particles or not. I get an affirmative answer. That is to say, if I calculate the field correlator in ground state or a vacuum state zero, then I take the phi x phi y squeezed across the state zero ket, and then I get some non-zero value. This is related to d three k two omega k e to the power i k dot x minus y. This, which is nothing but the inner two mode functions u k and u k star. At location x and y put together, so that becomes non-zero number for vacuum state. So obviously this is not counting ak dagger ak. Otherwise ak dagger ak would have given me zero. So but it is giving me some non-zero number. What happens if I change my state? If zero is changed to one particle state one k naught, you do the computation. It is straightforward harmonic oscillators all the time, and you get the answer. It is d3 k upon 2 omega k times e to the power i k x minus y which is the which would have come even for vacuum state plus u k not x and u star k not y u k is the mode function or the plane waves which we had written at location k not you see u has become a function of k not k not was the state you threw threw in you are calculating the expectation of i x phi y in the state of one particle at mode k not and the plane wave of that, the mode function of that, corrects the vacuum value. So there is a vacuum value which is the integral d3k, and but there on top of it, there is a, there are pieces which are sensitive to presence of particles. So if there are no particles, you will get just the integral d3k upon two omega k times e to the power i k x minus y. But if you have particles, there will be extra pieces apart from this vacuum part, and that tells you about the presence of particles so I, I look for correlators and i try to subtract out the vacuum value if i get a non-zero number that means the state contains a particle this is the philosophy of counting particles in this setup uh, can you hear me am i audible yes yes, yes. okay yeah we can hear you yes now for some reason i cannot move or uh, change my slides so there's some problem with this so i was wondering okay now it has started okay fine so now we have two pieces of information that plane waves are the mode functions which are which satisfy the klein gordon equations and are some notions of particles how many particles are there would be known through AK dagger AK is expectation, but through fields, if I want to construct something analogous to AK dagger AK, the nearest thing or first non trivial item which we get is the field correlators, phi x, phi y, and which we see obviously it is sensitive to presence of particles. On top of that, now we try to generalize the information which a particle content or particle count in quantum field theory tries to offer with the notion of general relativity what general relativity tells you that till now whatever we have discussed is a inertial coordinate system inertial frame particle field theory in inertial uh, coordinate system and so on 
but general relativity says that inertial frames are no special you can do your business in any frame okay so the way we have written the two point function or the correlator function phi x phi y which is this integral is written in inertial coordinates but general relativity tells me that i should not be worried about writing it in only inertial frames i can jump to non inertial frame as well and that comes up with a coast what is the coast so if i take the two point function phi x phi y and if i do a lorentz transformation which is the first arrow on the top and i land up in a new coordinate system which are inertially connected x prime then i see the plane wave structure remains the same therefore the two point structure remains the same the correlator does not change at all it just becomes the same integral in the new k variables k prime omega k prime e to the power i k prime dot x prime minus y prime so nothing has changed no additional piece has been added so if i do inertial transformation the two point correlator just says that the vacuum structure remains intact so inertially i have not added any particle however when i do a non inertial transformation for example i jump to an accelerating coordinate system t tilde and x tilde which are related to the inertial coordinate through this non linear transformation sin hyperbolic and cos hyperbolic come to that then i see apart from the vacuum piece in the new coordinate there is another piece which is generated this is some uh, hy this hypergeometric function 2f1 you can write i'm just skipping the mathematical detail but there is some function which will be added in the non inertial coordinate system and what did we learn in the previous slide if there is an extra piece compared to the vacuum integral that extra piece is a hallmark of presence of particles so that tells if i start with vacuum of inertial observer and remain in inertial frames i add no extra piece that means to observers which are inertially connected a vacuum state appears to be empty there is no particle however when i when i jump to an accelerating frame then the two point function picks up a piece apart from the vacuum and that extra piece is typically a hallmark of presence of particles so that is a giveaway that accelerated frames the do not see vacuum as vacuum first part first glimpse of what unru is trying to say you can quickly see this because the plane wave did not remain into plane wave k dot x was lorentz invariant but it is not a general coordinate transformation invariant object so the plane wave would distort to something else and any other function in new coordinate can be decomposed in terms of plane waves of the new coordinate system that is the mathematical crux of the statement this can also be seen partly through another set of uh, conceptual exercise which is a partial tracing of information so if i think about the inertial coordinate system tx the y axis and the x axis the violet kind of straight lines are the light cones of this space time and suppose i am talking about inertial coordinate system for example a particle a, a frame or an observer which does not move at all would be a line parallel to the t axis that would be a trajectory of a an observer which is not moving at all if that observer is moving with some velocity it would have a some tilted straight line with an angle in the light cone in the future uh, the forward light cone there will be straight line you can draw in the forward light cone and the backward light cone that would be a trajectory of a constant velocity observer however if you plot the trajectory of a accelerating observer which we just wrote in the previous slide again i am writing it i have uh, whatever i wrote in the previous slide t tilde and x tilde i am using the sines tau and zeta for that so for, forgive me for this kind of notional flips i would be doing across this things because i am taking snapshot from various papers which we have used different notions for i do not know for what reason so if i focus on this accelerating observer its trajectories are given by these green curves it is a hyperbolic trajectory you can see that t square minus x square satisfies the hyperbolic equation e to the power 2 is i so this generates a set of hyperbolae the property of hyperbolae is they asymptote to the straight lines so they asymptote to the light cones straight line which in another way is to say that the green curve on the right hand side on r starts asymptotic the past light cone at past time infinity and asymptotes the future light cone at future time infinity that is to say the trajectory of this 
accelerating observer remains contained in the region labeled as R. And similarly, the conjugate hyperbola is the green curve on the left hand side that also remain contained within the, the cone on the right hand side, the wedge on the right hand side. So left and the right things remain con uh, confined to one subsection of the full space time, unlike the constant velocity observer. Constant velocity observer moves from minus infinity to plus infinity, takes all the values of x from minus infinity to plus infinity. But the green curve just takes possi can possibly take values from the one half of the x-axis. So that is some truncation of availability of information. So whatever was a vacuum of inertial observer, those observers which were receiving signals from minus infinity of x to plus infinity of x, now in accelerated frame gets transformed into rece receiving of information from only one part of the x-axis. For example, you see that left and right, they are causally disconnected. Nothing from the left, a light ray from the left cannot enter the right or the light ray from the right cannot enter the left. So they are not communicating causally. So full spatial, so any observer in the right frame, the green observer in the right frame receives signals from P part and can send signal to F part. It can neither receive or send signal to the L part. So there is some piece of information which is removed away from him. And this removal of information typically results in interpretation of creation of particle. One, one naive example again, an analogical example you can think of is set of harmonic oscillators again. So think of a harmonic oscillator whose potential V1 I have plotted through the red curve. The ground state, the vacuum or this thing, if you remember harmonic oscillator quantization is a Gaussian centered at the minima of the potential. So the red curve, the red harmonic oscillator potential supports a red ground state, which is given as GS1, and it has a tail decaying part outside the potential in the, in the standard Gaussian way. However, if I look, off, look at a different harmonic oscillator potential with different frequency omega, then the green curve, for example, it has a different slope or a different uh, curve the, of uh, uh, this parabolic curve, which is depicted over here. It is narrower for this instance. And the ground state of this oscillator would be the green one. It has its own characteristics decay, which is decaying outside the potential in a Gaussian way. But you see, to an, ob uh, an observer in the green potential, the red curve will appear not as the ground state because ground state is the green curve in the green coordinate system or in the, in the green potential. So the red state, the red Gaussian state appears as somewhat excited state to the uh, potential of V2. So if you change your potential, you allow some regions to be less, pop, less uh, connected to this thing. Uh, here, less connected classically means classically uh, in the oscillator, anything outside the oscillator is classically forbidden. Quantum mechanically, there is a tail, but the decay profile becomes different. So if you truncate your information, for example, V2 observer, anything outside the potential is inaccessible. However, for classically inaccessible, for the red curve, anything outside the red potential is classically inaccessible. So therefore, V2 classically does not have access to a part of V1, which is not common to both of them. And therefore, it interprets as if the ground state of the V1 is an excited state of V2. The similar thing happens for Rindler, this, this trajectory, which is accelerated observer trajectory, which is called Rindler trajectory as well, because the full information is not available to it. Some part is being removed away and that removal classically removed part results in interpreting the ground state of the full system as if it is an excited state or populated state. So this is these two things that the correlator picks this up or you have removing some information hints to you that there are presence of particles when you jump to this kind of accelerated frames. Is this fine? Is this clear? Am I audible? 
Yes, Kajal, you are audible. Okay, okay. So at this stage, if there are any questions from the audience, I would like to take it up before we move forward. Any quick question? Okay, if not, uh, let us move forward. So now, uh, figuratively, we have uh, hit upon the idea that the non-inertial transformation um, uh, procedure of taking you from inertial frame to non-inertial frame results in creation of particles reflected in terms of additional pieces apart from the vacuum part in the two-point function. Fine. So it looks like that particles are created, but how many of them? So from this two-point function, you can construct number operator AK dagger AK if you want it and find out how many particles are created by doing this mathematical operation. This mathematical operation, this, this uh, UK star and phi x phi y is just the inner product of functions. This is a relativistic version of inner product of function. You might know about inner product of function from quantum mechanics, wave functions, inner product, you know how to calculate. It is some generalized coordinate invariant version of that. So I'm just again highlighting what it is without giving you mathematical structure of precisely how it is done, but it is somewhat related to what you have learned in quantum mechanics. So you take the two point function. Kinshank? Yes, yes. Uh, sorry, Kartik. Kinshank? Yes, yes, please go ahead. I didn't hear your voice. Yeah, there is a, a question in the chat. Oh, sure, I, sure, sure. Uh, I, I happen to see it only now. So the question is from Manu. Uh, mm -hmm. Will the result change if we assume a different field other than a scalar field? If yes, how? If no, uh, why? That's the question. Okay. Uh, actually, it's a very uh, interesting question. So, the if uh, hi Manu, if you can hear me, uh, yes. Huh. So, when you ask if the results would change if it is not a scalar field, uh, you are asking about the particle creation result or some other thing. Uh, so, what will be the result if I am assuming a vector field? Uh, uh, for example. So, for example, till now what we have discussed that you are starting with a some field. I have I'm talking about the scalar field. So the two point function is given like whatever expression I have. Suppose I do a vector field, for example, the expression on the right hand side would be a bit. However, the fact would remain still that under Lorentz transformation, whatever the structure is there, whatever integral appears, that remains invariant. That that will become a different integral, but that would not transform if you do an inertial transformation and that will again transform if you do a non-inertial transformation. So the fact that the apart from the vacuum piece, there will be an extra piece will be true across all kinds of fields, scalar, vector, tensorial, graviton, photon and whatnot. However, what precisely is vacuum structure and how many of the particles are created that would depend upon the uh, frame to which you are jumping as well as to which kind of particles you are talking about. Is this fine? Uh, okay. Uh, well, can I get de more details about such calculations? Sure, sure, sure. I will provide you some reference for that. And uh, you can, so there is one paper, uh, actually uh, we have worked about one paper with electric field itself and one coordinate system, but whatever we are discussing over here, if you do just for vector field, the Rindler transformation, this, uh, Red, uh, the green trajectory kind of uh, frames if you jump to, the final results remains the same that both of them, scalar or tensor or vector, they will all be thermally populated. Uh, I, I can try to uh, send you some references later on. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yes, so, uh, so how many of the uh, particles are created is known through this inner product which is just relativistic version of the usual inner product in quantum mechanics. And you take the two point function, you first evaluate its inner product with respect to mode functions conjugate at location X, UK star X. 
Then the resultant things, because there is an inner product between two x containing functions, x will be wiped out. Remember, psi x, phi x inner product in quantum mechanics is integrable over, integration over d3x and then psi x, phi x star. So if you do inner product of one function with respect to another, the variable on which it depends gets integrated over and is wiped out. So phi u, uk star x and phi x, phi y will integrate out x and the remaining thing will be a function of y. And then on the remaining function of y, you do another inner product with respect to uk and then you will get a number. So that is the way how you calculate the number of particles as seen in frame x whose mode functions are ukx given the correlator is phi x phi y. This is how you in quantum field theory you calculate things through the correlator. AK dagger AK is just an abstract way of counting things. You do not know how to construct AK dagger AK. But this operator tells you the two-point function or the correlator is an observable. Given that observable function, do this mathematical operation and you will get the answer of how many particles are there. So let us do it for simple uh, setting. For a vacuum state of a scalar field, I do this phi x phi y, which is this integral which we are seeing repeatedly, d3k e to the power ik x minus y. This is again a simple enough integral to do. If you compute this integral, you will end up getting 1 minus 4 pi squared times 1 upon x minus y squared. This x minus y is the 4, x is a 4 vector, y is a 4 vector, y is a 4 vector. So x minus y square is the magnitude of the 4 vector. A magnitude of a vector, 4 vector, v mu is minus of v naught square plus v1 square plus v2 square plus v3 square. So therefore, this object, what we have written over here is x0 minus y0 square with a minus sign plus x1 plus minus y1 whole square plus x2 minus y2 whole square plus x3 minus y3 whole square. This is what compactly I am calling x minus y square. Okay. So this is the correlator structure of scalar field in inertial coordinate system. To this, I start to count how many particles would be there in, two, in this two-point function or this correlator as seen by different observers. For example, if I talk about an inertial observer, inertial observer would find its mode functions to be this, as we have seen, k dot x is the four momentum, the four vector inner product, as we have seen before. And you do this computation. You take this uk star, take the inner product with respect to phi x, phi y, and then another inner product with respect to uk y. The result I'm claiming, and you can verify that you will get a number zero. To this inner, this two-point function, the inner, the inertial observer's mode function see nothing. Similarly, if you compute things for a boosted observer or, or a rotated observer or a translated observer, a Poincaré transformed observer, then the mode functions are UK primed, which is just the same thing in terms of primed coordinates. Then again, the computation, as we have discussed, will tell us that there will be no particles for this observer either. So even the boosted observer does not see any particle in this. However, things become interesting if you do the same computation, not for inertial observer, but a non-inertial observer of the kind which we have discussed. The mode functions as seen in the tilde coordinate or this tau zeta coordinate, they are both the same thing. So T and X are related non trivially like this. And if you do the computation with respect to this mode function, then you end up getting a non-zero NK, NK tilde. NK tilde is the number count as seen from the accelerated observer in the state which was declared vacuum according to all inertial observers. And you get this non-zero number is has a peculiar structure. It is delta zero divided by exponential of something minus one. Now this exponential of something minus one we have seen repeatedly in our statmic process. So I can define a number density, delta zero, if you are worried about, don't get worried too much about it because delta zero is nothing but the volume of the space you are living in. So you divide by that and you get a number density. In quantum field theory, most of the time you work with Lagrangian density, Hamiltonian density. So you earn up number density. You do not get the numbers directly because like Hamiltonian, like, like uh, any observables, quadratic observables are divergent. You define the densities of those. So number density is a well-defined thing, one over exponential of something minus one. And this looks strikingly similar to what we have seen in statmic or thermodynamical system. It is a number, uh, it's a population density of a thermal distribution. 
provided you identify this t as from the variables appearing in the first equation. If I try to match the thermal distribution to the first expression, I end up getting t is equal to h bar times a divided by kb times speed of light c. So that is what Unruh effect is about. If I talk, if I ask an inertial observer how many particles are there in this two point correlator, they will say zero. If I ask an uh, accelerated frames observer how many particles are there in this two point function, which was evaluated from the ground uh, vacuum of the inertial observer, that observer will say it is thermally populated at a temperature related to its acceleration, h bar times a and divided by kb times c. It generates a temperature for you. But as you can see, this is being suppressed so hugely by presence of h bar division by c that you almost get close to nothing result in the sense of, for example, uh, acceleration of Earth, the magnitude being uh, roughly 10 meter per second square. If you feed in this much of acceleration, the temperature you will see is 10 to the power minus 19 Kelvin. That is to say, the temperature generated by in the inertial in the non-inertial frame, which is moving at an acceleration 10 meter per second square, the temperature is you, it will see a thermal distribution of particle with temperature or the peak happening at 10 to the power minus 19 Kelvin, absolutely low scale temperature. And actually, this thermal distribution by now everyone here I hope is familiar with. It's this kind of distribution as you see in this plot. And its peak lies at the value kbt in the, in the energy space, kbt. kb is the Boltzmann constant and t is the temperature. So kb itself is a very small number. t itself right now we are generating for 10 meter per second square as minus 19. So it will generate a very tiny peak at a very tiny value. This is the enhanced version of that which you are looking at. But if you look realistically, it would be a very small hump lying very uh, hugging the x axis very closely. There will be very tiny hump of the order of 10 to the power minus 40 kind of uh, height would be the 10 to the power minus 40 joule kind of thing would be there. And actually this kind of thermal structure appears at various places in curved space time or non-inertial frame. And most of the times this is the structure h bar times the characteristic parameter of the theory divided by kbc. For in non-inertial transformation, this hash, the characteristic scale is acceleration. For black hole, you will see if you do the similar kind of computation, it is inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole. And H for accelerating universes, the Hubble, the rate of the scale would be the Hubble, the rate of change of the scale factor that sits in there. And all these things are extremely tiny number. So most of the times you will find that in all these interesting setups, the particles created is very, very small. The temperature is very, very small. And how do I know if this theoretical prediction is correct? Meaning, how do I experimentally verify or try to verify that? What observation will tell me that whatever I'm doing is really a 10 to the power minus 19 Kelvin experiment and not a zero Kelvin experiment? Is there enough resolution in any experimental setup which can tell a dif difference between zero Kelvin and 10 to the power minus 19 Kelvin? No, we do not have anything. We most of the times we are work, even in the cryogenic system, we are working with milli Kelvin system, 10 to the power minus 3 Kelvin. And occasionally you can go very in very sophisticated labs up to 10 to the power minus 9 Kelvin, nano Kelvin scales. And there will be very, very marginal effects at that level, which could be seen. 10 to the power minus 19 is a hopeless game. Okay. Probably 0 Kelvin and 1 Kelvin can be separated apart. If you, you have one Kelvin effect, probably that can be seen in some observable, some laboratory setting, but 10 to the power minus 19 Kelvin is hopeless. But in order to generate one Kelvin effect, you need to change the temperature from minus 19 Kelvin, 10 to the power minus 19 Kelvin to one Kelvin. That is to, you have to increase the acceleration by 19 orders. So we were already doing experiment at 10 to the uh, 10 meter per second square. If I have to scale the acceleration by 10 to the power 19 order further, I'm talking about 10 to the power 20 meter per second square kind of acceleration. This is enormous acceleration. Compare with the largest accelerator we know, LHC. 
This is protons in LHC. We have protons moving in a circular trajectory of roughly periphery 26 kilometers, which is four kilometer radius, roughly. And you can compare, compute how much, what is the order of magnitude of the acceleration of protons going into this. And you'll find out this is 10 to the power 13 meter per second square. So even in LHC, you can go, it is a rotating kind of thing, but still the magnitude wise it is accelerating and it is magnitude is 10 to the power 13 meter per second square. That is to say, it's still way below, seven orders below one Kelvin. It is a fraction of a micro Kelvin kind of thing would be happening if the same thing goes through in LHC. Suppose I want to see a one Kelvin effect in a LHC setup. What do you do? In order to increase the acceleration, you have to decrease the radius of the circular trajectory. And if you want it to go close to 10 to the power 20 or 21 meter per second square, you are talking about LHC at roughly hundreds of micrometer. So you are protons traveling in circular trajectory in a micrometer setup rather than a 26 kilometer setup, which we have. So all the machineries and all these things put together to accelerate protons at speed of light, almost 99% of speed of light level would have to fit in a micrometer set setup, which looks almost impossible to do. So therefore it looks that there is no possible way of directly detecting a presence of thermal particles as predicted from the inertial, uh, from the non-inertial. I see there is a question in the chat box. So can, can I? Yeah, so uh, Manu is asking, is the temperature observed by the non-inertial observer actual temperature or some Lagrangian multiplier, which one can interpret as temperature? Something so, like negative temperature for laser system. Yeah. So let me see if I can read it directly. Somehow in the full presentation mode, this is not accessible. I can only see the notes. But anyway, so if, if your question is whether this is a real temperature or it's just a mathematical structure which we have developed, this would be known if you put a real-time thermometer in the system. For example, a hydrogen atom or a two-level system. And in two-level system, put in thermal set setting, distributes its population across ground state and excited state in a Boltzmann fashion. Number of particles in ground state versus number of particles in excited state would be found related with a factor e to the power minus beta delta energy gap. So that is the ratio in which these two, part, two states will be populated. The same thing if you do for collection of two-level system or collection of hydrogen atoms accelerated, you will find exactly the same happen, that they will be found at ground state and the excited state in the precise ratio given by e to the power minus delta e divided by a. This time a is a mimic of a temperature. So indeed, even operationally, it is mathematically which we have discussed till now, but even if you do operationally, the atoms will be excited and ground state ratio will be same as if they do in the thermal distribution. So Manu, does this answer your query? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So this, this, this scheme of thing is called Undo If you are familiar with the terminology, you can look at it up. Undo DV detector precisely tries to do this. And this is somewhat we have done in the work which I'm going to talk about, but I, it looks like I'm running out of time. So let me skip over various things. So people have tried over. So we see uh, that the Kinjal, yeah, I mean, you need not skip over in the sense that generally the talks do run over. So if you would like to go at your own pace, that is also fine. Uh, okay, but my own pace, uh, I am roughly less than halfway. So oh, okay, okay. So yeah. let's see. So, let's see if 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 there are questions, I can try to come back to those slides. But I will try to wrap up in the next 15 minutes if this is fine yeah that should be fine next 15 20 minutes should be fine okay okay good so as we see that to see the effects of natural accelerations of the order of 10 meter per second square or 100 meter per second square or even 1 kilometer per second square those kind of naturally accessible accelerations the temperatures are enormously tiny and they are hopelessly small to witness directly. In order to generate very high temperature, you need to go to an acceleration scale of 10 to the power 20 meter per second square, which again, we do not know 
how to do that either create a micro lhc or something which is not only conceptually very challenging but monetarily hugely costing so you do not know what to do people try to come up with shortcuts what they try to do for example there are various ways people try to bypass the requirement of this high acceleration i have listed few of them so uh, again i am just giving a bullet point summary of this people for example try to look for an child particles accelerating it emits various kinds of radiation for example a synchrotron radiation and then because of its accelerated motion it sees particles its trajectory becomes slightly zigzag because of bombardment of thermal particles conceptually it, it should happen so therefore it should reflect in the since bombardment of thermal particles will uh, will introduce a jitter to a trajectory it will ultimately go on to lead to a jitter in the synchrotron radiation emission profile as well so therefore you look for emission from a accelerated charged particle and try to see if there is any jitter hint of a jitter thermal jitter into that people have tried this as a possible way of detecting unruh effect similarly uh, particles if they are in excited state they decay to ground state with some rate in vacuum versus in thermal environment so there is a thermal rate of decay versus a vacuum rate of decay so if accelerated observers do see thermal particles their rate of decays will become different in accelerated frame for instance a proton whose lifetime is very large in inertial coordinate system will become a thermally decaying particle in accelerated frame and this kind of plot they generate that at what acceleration what would be the lifetime of a proton most of the times we are very close to accessible accelerations which we have x is here x here in the this plot is a log a kind of thing so most of the times we have access to very small acceleration that is very we are very close to the y axis most of the times and we do not see any appreciable change in the lifetime of a proton in any realistic accelerating system in order to see the lifetime being very different from what we see in normal systems we have to generate an acceleration again of high order this is this 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 calculations is just a theoretical possibility but experimentally if you want to see really a lifetime decay rate change of protons you have to go to acceleration as high as 22 10 to the power 22 meter per second square so this is again a hopeless this is just a theoretical possibility but experimentally nobody knows how to get it sorted there are various kind of analog systems or even quantum information probes for example geometric phases entanglement and what not all these try to bring the scales down some of them do it successfully for few orders for example this uh, last item which i have written through geometric phase measurement how do i do measure a geometric phase this is an interesting set of uh, discussions all together which i am not going into but geometric phases are very sensitive to tiny changes in the trajectories and if thermal particles introduce some change in your trajectory it will result in change in the geometric phase and if you have heard of this arno bohm effect you know that geometric phases are very sensitive to tiny tiny features in quantum uh, quantum configuration space so through these kind of probes it is argued that it is possible to bring down the requirement of high acceleration by few orders 10 to the power 20 meter per second square for these setups will become 10 to the power 15 meter per second square for instance but even that that 10 to the power 15 meter per second square is two orders away from the lhc and in lhc so big a setup quantum in this geometric phase information is wiped out geometric phases have this disadvantage that for long distances they are destroyed very rapidly so this is hopeless to do a geometric phase measurement even a advanced lhc kind of thing so you all of them are somewhat promising but none of them cuts the case so that they can be readily implemented in any known system or any what one can look forward to any implementation of that they are at least 7 to 8 to 10 orders away from whatever the most sophisticated setups today can reach up to so this this first review i cited in the reference this lists majority of the attempts which are going on to see the to realize the experimental prediction that how to see presence of particle theory theories predicts that there should be thermally population thermally populated particles in non inertial frame which inertial observers call a vacuum state 
but experimentally there is no way of ratifying this it looks like there is none so what do we do so we ask the question what is going wrong why it is not an observable quantity of course the temperature as we see becomes very small and low low temperature effects are very difficult to see that is might be the zero order answer but if we probe deep why low temperature effects are so difficult to see would be the crux, crux of the question one should ask so let us look at this thermal profile once more so this is how the particle density would be created one over exponential of something minus 1 where temperature is proportional to acceleration what happens to this density if i talk about low acceleration omega times c speed of light divided by acceleration a becomes a very large number when it becomes a very large number exponential of a very large number is again a very large number so you can forget the one about it and therefore this number density becomes e to the power minus of omega times c upon a which is a very small number now because omega c by a is very large number and omega becomes very small number so it gets very quickly killed not large number of particles are created for small accelerations however if you probe deeply this statement is true only when not not only when a is small but omega is also not very small so when omega is appreciably large and a is small then only omega by a becomes a large number if omega by a both of them are very small maybe omega by a is of the order of a and even better if i take omega towards zero infrared regime low frequency regime then omega by a turns to zero and exponential omega by a turns towards one therefore number density starts diverging this is true for any thermal population that its infrared sector many 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 particles are created so number density is really really large at the infrared sector so particle it's not that low number of particle gets created at low acceleration they do get created but they get created appreciably at the wrong end at the lower energy section and this is problematic in two way first of all they are low energy particles so they are not able to do many things so low energy modes are highly populated n omega is very large for small omega so low energy modes are highly populated there is one problem that their energy is low second problem is that though the low energy modes are highly populated there are not enough low energy modes available because if you look for the distribution in the full frequency space there is a factor omega square also comes up if, if you calculate any meaningful quantity for example total number of particles so this this thermal distribution if you see its high energy tail is determined by this exponential decay while its low energy drop comes from omega square going towards zero so omega square goes quickly towards zero towards low omega that to that is to say field modes which could have been highly populated are reduced in number so there are not enough number of modes available at low frequency to be thermally populated so these two effects put together are killing you your jobs so despite large number of particles could have been created but the slots where they could have been created are very few in nature so the low energy omega square drop is one of the culprit where interesting things are happening high number of particles are getting created the omega square is killing the net effect off so the culprit is not low temperature really the culprit is omega square which is becomes vanishingly smaller at small omega so what one can try to do uh, can you hear me again i am unable to move my slides once more so i do not know if it is audible or visible to you Uh, Kinjal, you are audible and the slides are visible. You might want to uh, uh, point. Uh, yes, yes. The Now pointer, if you click. Yeah. So let me see. No, it is going in the backward direction. So let me see if it goes in the forward direction. Yes, it is. Most likely, yes. Okay. So the strategy, as we discussed, that even at low temperature, interesting things might have happened. if there were enough number of modes available which does not become available because of this omega square or in terms of wave number the k square drop so the strategy which we can try to in this work which i am going to talk about now this is the work with jafino which i talked about initially i am going to review it very quickly and this the strategy in that work is to arrest this k square fall so i try to develop a scenario in which 
the density of mode does not fall as omega square and that would try to populate the, that would try to allow enough number of modes to get populated and on top of that we will try to look for some phenomena which reacts very vehemently against presence of particles so for example thermal quivering or thermal jitter motion they are sensitive to particles but not very aggressively we will try to look for avenues which react very aggressively to presence of particles and we will see both of them happening in one setup and see if there will be any net effect which which is observable so let us address it one by one to address it uh, uh, real uh, to address this question in a fruitful setting let me ask this question suppose i excite in a hydrogen atom or even in two level system if i excite the system and put it to excited state e1 what do you expect what would happen if i leave it at e1 so i want one answer from audience someone please unmute yourself and tell me if i excite the atom and leave it at excited state e1 what do you expect what should happen next spontaneous emission yeah so uh, who is it can you tell your name i know uh, sorry i missed your name uh, Manu here. So oh, Manu here. Oh, Manu again. Okay, okay, okay. So Manu correctly points out that if I leave it there, it would not remain in the excited state forever. It will decay down to the ground state, and he used some term called spontaneous decay. So it decays to ground state. What does? Why does it decay to ground state? In an ideal world, if you have seen a quantum mechanic, if you know about uh, quantum mechanics, you know. Eigen states of Hamiltonians are steady states. That means they do not change over time. They only pick up phase. So the, uh, so the probability of finding a particle in Eigen state of Hamiltonian remains the same throughout. That is in ideal world story. That is a Hamiltonian you completely know. But most of the times there are terms in the Hamiltonian which we ignore, and they act as perturbations. And those perturbations drive you down or up depending upon how strengthful your perturbation is. So in a non-ideal world, a realistic world, the atom or the two-level system which we are talking about reacts and talks, interacts with everything around it, including a background field as well. For example, a hydrogen atom, apart from its usual Hamiltonian, which is P square of the electron and 1 by R potential due to Coulomb interaction, and there can be hyperfine interaction, fine LS coupling, all these things put together. There is scope of another piece of Hamiltonian, which we typically ignore, is the dipole moment of the hydrogen atom talks to the background electric field, if there is any electric field around. So there is a D dot E kind of coupling is also possible. We typically do not write, saying that they are too small to be considered about. But this too small to be considered about things are the culprits which drive this excited state to the ground state. Even if there is no electric field put explicitly, Quantum mechanically, you will say that electric field is put in vacuum state. And then there are tiny fluctuations in the vacuum state of electric field as well, which drive the excited state to the ground state at the cost of an emission of a photon. So excited state hydrogen atom goes to ground state hydrogen atom and emits a photon at the cost. And this is called the spontaneous decay, spontaneous emission, what Manu talked about. This is driven by vacuum fluctuations. Even if electric field is non -zero, is zero in expectation, there is no electric field put, put together, state is vacuum. There is vacuum fluctuations which drive excited to the ground state. But do we know such a thing happens? This is again a theoretical calcul cal computations. So if you try to estimate, if you try to find out the rate of transition from excited to the ground state through this interaction term. This is again a first order perturbation theory calculation one can do straightforward way. And you get the rate of the decay. The rate of the decay of atom from the excited to the ground state is given by this expression where omega, capital omega, which is appearing is the energy or frequency gap between excited and the ground state. Call it delta E. I'm just writing it omega. D square is the dipole moment of the atom, epsilon naught, h bar, c cube, everything is familiar to you. So just put relevant numbers for hydrogen atom. Some hundreds of megahertz is the typical energy gap between excited and the ground state in with LS coupling and whatnot in hydrogen atom. D is Coulomb 
uh, electron charge times one angstrom is the typical radius scale. So that would give you estimate of 10 to the power minus 29 coulomb meter is the dipole moment, roughly of the order of. And put everything together, you will get this number is 10 to the power minus 16 per second. The rate at which it decays from excited to the ground state is this small, 10 to the power minus 16 per second. That is to say, if I take one hydrogen atom in the excited state and wait for it to decay to the ground state through vacuum fluctuation, it will take me 10 to the power 16 seconds, which is roughly the lifetime of the universe. So theoretical prediction tells me that it should decay down to the ground state through vacuum fluctuations. Experimentally, again, this is a meaningless number because it will take universe lifetime for it to decay. So one bypasses it through various ways that this is, a, this is the rate for one atom. If you take one Avogadro number, one mole of atoms, 10 to the power 23 of hydrogen atoms, then few of them, 10 to the power 6 or 7 of them, will decay down spontaneously. But the cost you pay that if you introduce 10 to the power 23 Avogadro number of atoms near about, their dipole-dipole interaction also starts caring and you are really never very sure what caused your decay down, whether the vacuum fluctuations or interaction with the second hydrogen atom, the dipole-dipole coupling. So this, this, this would could have been the same order of magnitude problem which we looked about just now in terms of undue acceleration. But this is not a well-spoken problem as of now in the modern day physics. You never come across how to see or verify spontaneous emission because of this. This is a work of Purcell in as early as 1946. This vacuum decay and whatnot being very small was known in even in 1940s, early 1940s and 1930s, later, late, later half of the 1930s. In 1946, Purcell came up with the idea which said that, okay, let, this computation stands true for the, vac, the field in vacuum state in flat space time when we have free space, meaning I do not have, the full space time is available to me. This omega cube you are seeing, which is appearing over here, is actually originating from multiplication of energy gap with the same omega square which we are seeing over here. So the smallness of this rate is also partly due to the separation of omega square, which we saw the Unruh effect is very sensitive to. The spontaneous decay's smallness was also partly attributed towards that omega square's presence itself. In the computation, this omega cube comes from integration of that omega square with d omega ultimately. So what Purcell said that this is a computation in free space. Let us not use free space, but use a cavity. A cavity is like a closed system in which electric field dies down on the boundary. For example, a metallic cage kind of thing, metallic walls. And you construct a cavity which supports, so if you have done particle in a box problem, you know that eigen energy is, or the K, the momentum number dies down on the boundary of the wall. And there are only finite number of modes which are supported. And they are supported at that particular numbers in ideal world, which is reflected by energy, the density of modes being almost a delta function. The delta function would be an ideal case where only those values are supported. In a non-ideal or a practical cavity, it would be very close to a delta function, which is like a Lorentzian. The profile which I have written is a Lorentzian kind of thing. Q is the Lorentzian parameter. When Q becomes infinity, this becomes a delta function. So a realistic cavity is marked by a Q parameter, which is called its quality factor. For a finite quality factor, the delta function becomes Lorentzian of this sort. And once you do the computation with of uh, decay rate, not in free space, but in a cavity of this density of modes, this expression of uh, decay rate from being proportional to omega Q now becomes proportional to Q over V. So capital omega by C cube, this omega by C is like wave number K. So KQ proportionality gets replaced by Q by V. So apart from D square epsilon H, previous time, one of the culprit of a smallness of gamma naught, the rate was small value of K cube, the infrared sector. Now in the infrared sector, this mode function is now, this density is there, not omega square. 
So this density therefore is Q by V proportional and ultimately for small Q, for, for large Q and small volume of cavity with high enough quality factor and small volume, the rate becomes very large. It can be substantial. And that is how most of the time hydrogen atom or any other systems spontaneous emission is tested. So this cavity setup arrests the omega square fall, which is one of the requirements which we talked about. Okay. We have, a, if we use cavity, this K square fall is arrested. When it is arrested, then you automatically see that the interesting thing where more most particles are being created at low omegas may turn up alive. The second piece which we wanted was something which reacts very aggressively to presence of particles. And that, as we are already familiar, is again the decay of excited atom. If there are particles, not only there is a, if there are no particles, it decays down through spontaneous emission, vacuum fluctuations. If there are particles, those particles also play in the role and they cause the atoms to decay faster, the stimulated emission. This you might already know in terms of lasers. This fact happened that if you shine, you take a bunch of collect, uh, a bunch of atoms which are excited, and then you shine even a small number of photons. On the other side of you, you it you get a large number of photons at the result. So it's a light amplification by stimulated emission. So the lasers are testimony to this process that this setup, bunch of excited atoms are very sensitive to presence of particles. One, even one photon is able to do the cascade. One atom, one photon will trigger any one of the atoms in the ensemble, then it becomes two photons, and then two photons trigger many of them. So it is avalanche effect. So it is very, particularly very sensitive to presence of particles. So, so we employ in our work with Jaffino, we employ both of these. We use cavity as well as we use excited state. So the crux is, if cavity arrests the fall of the density of modes and the atoms are excited, when they are accelerated, they should see thermal particles according to own rule. And according to this laser effect, if there are particles present, they should decay very quickly. So if they are not accelerating, they would decay through spontaneous emission. That would be some rate in free space and some other rate in the uh, inside a cavity. On top of that, if they start accelerating, they will see particles and they will decay even faster in the accelerating case through the thermal presence of thermal particles, simulated one. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, the same problem. Okay. So let me, okay. I, I'll, this is the same information which we discussed about. I will jump through it. I will just come back to the, you do the computation of this setup, excited atom. In the cavity, now the cavity, I am talking about a cylindrical cavity on whose boundary the field phi, for your case, for example, electric field can is zero across the boundary, the wall of the cylindrical cavity. I do the computation, so mathematical part again, I am skipping over. I have to solve the Klein-Gordon equation, not in free space, but in the cylindrical setup. We do that and find out how quickly an excited atom decays inside this spherical cavity. Then you get uh, this expression. So I'm just skipping this, all the mathematical details to so just give you the final expression on this slide. This is the rate of emission in the cylindrical cavity of an atom whose energy gap is capital omega. So there are two, three pieces, which are actually two important pieces, which are coming into the play. Look at the last equation on this slide. The last equation on this slide is giving me the density of a state rho omega k inside a cylindrical cavity. I omega k tells you which modes participate in this emission. So if you are talking about cylindrical cavity, you see that rho of omega k has some distribution which becomes very large whenever your mode function omega k is close to zeta mn. Zeta mn is the nth zero of mth Bessel function. So Bessel functions appear because they are cylindrical function. In cylindrical geometry, those are the relevant mode function. How do they, these calculations come about? It's again, a detail is a, a question of details. I'm skipping over it, but you see the structure that whenever omega k is very close to zeta mn by the radius of the cylinder, then rho omega k diverges abruptly. That means at these, 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 these values, whenever omega k is becomes close to one of the zeta mn by r, then the mode density of states becomes very large. If I make the radius of this cylinder sufficiently large, I can 
make the density of modes to diverge at smaller omega k, k values. So I can shift my rise, I can arrest the omega k square fall. Not only I can arrest, I can make, make it diverge even for a smaller omega k by appropriately choosing the R. And then look for the emission of a excited state hydrogen atom inside this. And this is just half a page of calculation you have to do. And you end up getting this rate e equation ultimately. This is the rate equation. Again, how many modes participate in this gets decided by this I. Now, for inertial system, when you are not accelerating, this I, if you look at I is a Bessel K function divided by 2 omega. This Bessel K function divided by 2 omega becomes a Dirac delta when acceleration is 0. That is to say, only those modes which have the same frequency as the energy gap of the hydrogen atom, they participate if you are not accelerating in this process. However, when you are accelerating, the Dirac delta function is replaced by this Bessel upon 2 omega. The importance upon Bessel upon 2 omega is this. The Dirac delta supports only those modes which are very close to which are very close to the energy gap. And of the energy gap, the Dirac delta falls very rapidly. However, this Bessel K does not fall very rapidly. It, its rate of fall is slower compared to the Dirac delta function. So what happens that at the resonance point, which is capital omega, Dirac delta's height is enormous. Bessel K's height is not that large. So at the resonance, the inertial calculation wins, the inertial rate of emission wins because K is replaced by delta, its height is very large and you have a very large emission rate if you are not accelerating. If you are accelerating at the resonance points, capital omega, omega, capital omega is the energy gap, the field mode at the uh, energy gap. The Bessel function is not that much in height. It is still very high, but not as, high, as much high as the Dirac delta. So it also predicts a large number at the resonance point but it is smaller than the inertial uh, emission rate. So at the resonance, the spontaneous emission wins, but if you go slightly off resonance, you move slightly away, for inertial case, the Dirac delta, in the inertial case, the Dirac delta falls very rapidly and the spontaneous emission rate becomes very small very quickly, but the Bessel K, which turns alive for non, for non-inertial cases, for accelerating case, that does not fall that rapidly and remains substantially large when you are off resonant. So if you are not accelerating, you will emit only at select frequencies. If you are accelerating, you are emit even at slightly off resonance frequency. This is the prediction of this calculation. And this is the theoretical plot one should see. The orange curve corresponds to the emission profile of inertial atom. The blue curves correspond to emission profile of accelerated atom. So you see the follow the orange curve, you will see the or the inertial atom would emit very vigorously at the resonance points where the peaks of this thing and quickly die down off resonance. But for a non-inertial or accelerated atom, there will be emission at the resonance points, which is slightly less than the inertial case. But if you go slightly away from the resonance, this circled Thing which we are zooming into, you see that the non-inertial is typically higher than the in inertial case. So the rate, the decay will be happening. The decay will be happening in the non-inertial case, even if you are slightly off resonant. Inertially, you go slightly off resonant, nothing will happen because the spontaneous decay will not that much be supported. Non-inertially, due to presence of thermal particles, it will be decaying with still substantial rate. And you can see how much is the emission rate. Delta F, up, delta F is the rate of emission upon delta is roughly order of unity. That is to say, for 100 megahertz, the rate of emission will be 10 to the power 8 per second. This, this is a, a substantial number. And this can be done for even for low accelerations. So you see, we have plotted things for very various accelerations. On X axis, it is being plotted how much away you are from the resonance point. Epsilon is marking your deviation away from resonance point. The plots are telling me the contrast of accelerated minus non-accelerated case. Both of them will emit with some rate, but in accelerated case, if it is larger emission, accelerated minus non-accelerated would be a positive number. 
So you see, if you miss the, if you are close to the zero on the x-axis, you see that the delta F goes in the negative side, that is to say inertial emission wins. But if you go slightly off resonant, the non-inertial thing starts winning. And the different, different curves here are for different, different kind of cavities, let us say. We have shown calculation for a cylindrical case, but we generalize it for more general setup where the density of mode is given by one over beta plus r something something. This is a more general re realistic density of modes in various geometries. And these different different curves correspond to different choices of beta. From panel one to panel two to panel three to panel four, we are changing the accelerations in the smaller side. The topmost left curve corresponds to acceleration of 10 to the power 10 meter per second square, while the rightmost plot on the bottom is 10 to the power 7, or 10 to the power 7 meter per second squares. These are 9, uh, 10, 9, 8, 7. So these are four ex different accelerations. So you see, even if you are 10 to the power 8 meter per second square acceleration, your hydrogen atoms will decay very fast off resonant. How much off resonant? Resonance point is x is equal to zero. If you are 10, in, uh, uh, epsilon is 10 to the power minus four. That is to see, that is to say, if you are roughly hundreds of micrometers away from the resonant geometry, R, remember R over here would have decided what is the frequency at which it will become maximum. You have to choose your R, some hundreds of micrometers, which is a fraction some fractions of nanometers, uh, some fractions of uh, millimeters away from the resonance geometry, then whatever emission is happening in hydrogen atom is primarily happening due to stimulated emission. If particles are not accelerated in this, this cavity, then it will not decay. But if it is accelerated, it will decay even at very low accelerations. So this is the, take, uh, the prediction of this thing that in order to test uh, UNRU effect, a cavity can be built, the geometry and other things we have qualified and listed. That we, I want a cavity of length of few hundreds of centimeter, roughly fractionally below a meter, and a radius again of fraction of centimeters. So this kind of cylindrical setup is ideal for setting or uh, checking hydrogen atom excited states decay. And if it decays in this, this cavity, it will decay primarily through stimulated emission and not through spontaneous emission. Spontaneous emission in this geometry will be very small. If it decays, it will decay only through stimulated emission. And if it decays in a state which inertial observer calls it vacuum, that means it is decaying through presence of unruh particles. And then we have tried to test the strength of the parameters which we are putting it, how good the cavity should be, how much of the quality factor. Infinite quality factor is the exact com computation which we have done, but realistically, most of the advanced cavities can be, generate, can be generated with some quality factor. The best cavity available in any lab today in the world is 10 to the power 11 quality factor thing, but our computations show that you do not need to go to that much high of a quality factor. Any marginal quality factor or easily, relatively easily achievable quality factor 10 to the power 4 or 5 will give you a result which is different from this computation by at most 0.3 or 0.03 percent away. That is, there is no significant change in the rate of emission which will happen in non-perfect uh, non perfect cylindrical cavity as well. So this is the unroot tunnel which we are talking about. In this unroot tunnel, a cylindrical cavity of some specified geometry and length, you let an atom fall at an acceleration of roughly 10 to the power 7 meter per second square, some six order away from the natural acceleration due to gravity scale. The prediction is that if UNRU effect is true, that hydrogen atom which is excited and accelerating at this acceleration will decay quickly if it is accelerating. The same hydrogen atom will not decay at all if it is not accelerating. And whether or not it decays can be tested with some effort in modern labs. So, the crux, the take home of today's discussion or the left uh, second half of this discussion is that this cavity geometry sets up a unique density of mode structure, which is very sensitive to where it will peak and what it will do. And you can align that to your requirements. You can want it, you want it to become 
more significant at the value where UNRU effect is supposed to come up very effectively. And then in a slightly off resonant cavity where the inertial thing falls very rapidly, non-inertial thing remains somewhat non-zero, that will enhance the stimulated emission component and all other emissions channel that is highly suppressed. Spontaneous em emission decays to nothing. If there are th some thermal noise, you can show that it also decays to nothing. So whatever is happening, whatever emission is happening in this off resonance cavity is primarily happening due to UNRU stimulated emission only. So it is a very robust kind of check which we are trying to propose. Would be if someone performs this, if someone characterizes a cavity whose known, known density of states and other things which resemble very well to this kind of setup, then our prediction looks very formidable. And therefore, the use of precise geometry, we are talking about precision of the order of hundreds of micrometers, which is challenging, but not, un not undoable. So the usage of cavity with a precise geometry and slightly off resonance confidence replaces the requirement of extreme acceleration. Without that, as we discussed in the first half, the requirement was to go as high as an acceleration of 10 to the power 20 meter per second square. But in these cavities with sophisticated precision, we are able to bring it down to 10 to the power 7 meter per second square kind of acceleration as well. And these kind of accelerations are easy to generate. 10 to the power 7 meter per second square is easy to generate. For microscopic particle, 10 to the power 5, 6 meter per second square is routinely done in lab setup. So one order away is not on any, cha any what challenging. So generating acceleration is not the challenge. Generating the geometry of the cavity with this much precision is the key. If one can do that, one needs one not need not go to high acceleration to test the ondo effect. And this kind of cavity qualitatively, as we have seen, will lead to an emission which is purely driven, purely with, within quotes, driven by presence of Undo thermal particles. Okay, so I have taken enough amount of time and I thank you for your patience for listening me out. I'll be happy to take questions, but uh, sorry, I have overstepped in terms of time. So I, I'm done. I'm done. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Kinchal, for a nice talk. So, yeah, we can uh, take a few questions. Uh, can you, uh, if you have questions, please so raise Kinchal, your hands. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. so Kinchal, I just wanted to ask about like, uh, so what are the uh, efforts after this work? Uh, mm -hmm. So are there follow up papers uh, and uh, or experimental attempts, etc, that are following up from this paper? Uh, yes, yeah, so yes, so yes, this is a very interesting question. And so there are two two things which which is which are going on at the moment. So one is that we have done for an atom which is being accelerated and whatnot. Now we want to generalize this computation for a realistic experimental setting, a real time cavity for a known Q and whatnot. So we have been in so at least I have been talking to some experimentalists at IIT Delhi and Inter University Accelerator Center in Delhi put together these two set of people are fairly confident about creating this kind of environment for me. What they want is to analyze, so for example, for to accelerate an atom inside a cavity, you have to put up some electric field and whatnot inside the cavity. The vacuum calculation tells me one spontaneous emission rate and correspondingly UNRU stimulated emission rate. But if you want to accelerate an atom, the easiest way of accelerating atom is to make it charged. Let us say, uh, not a, a hydrogen or atom, use a helium plus with one electron removed. That is like hydrogen like atom, which is charged that can be accelerated with presence of electric field, but that presence of electric field brings additional channels of decay. That is to say inside cavity, if it is not non vacuum state, then the rate becomes uh, stimulated even in the inertial case. In non-inertial case, there will be stimulated plus additional things coming from the UNRU bath. So this computation is being done on one front. If one can show even in this case, there will be appreciable thing, then probably they will try to go ahead with that. So that is on close contact with experimental side. So we are trying, we are hopeful that it would be wrapped up in some time and we'll be able to 
if it looks promising, go ahead with trying to start generating cavities of the, that sort. If one can, so making this cavity is not easy, as it I have told in the talk. It is somewhat easier than generating high acceleration, but it's still that is formidable job. So then we will try to if the computations are uh, convincing the, of those setup. Then the idea is to first try to fabricate a cavity with desired density of states. So that would be a somewhat few months or year long enterprise, which we are looking forward to. The experimental side, I'm talking to people and they are showing interest. And let us see, it looks promising. On theoretical sides, there are uh, follow up calculations on entanglement versions of that. Some uh, Jafino and there was another student over here who were, were looking on that. So there was paper on that, additional kind of effects in these with quantum information channel. Those kind of theoretical computations are doable and some computations have been done in that. But right now, uh, I'm looking more forward to getting in touch with people with experiments. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, hello. Ah, yes, please, please go ahead. Sorry, uh, yeah. uh, hi, Kinchal, I'm Hari uh, Dao student. Hi, hi, Ari. Ah, hi. So I wanted to know the like in analog gravity they use this circular motion, uh, circular detectors instead of uh, accelerator detectors. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so is this experiment like can be done in a similar setup like uh, for rotating detectors? Huh. So actually, uh, what I have talked about is about Unruh tunnel uh, today. But there was a preceding paper before that, which was a rotating detector calculation exactly in a cavity. So there we showed that the similar kind of thing happens, that you tune your cavity resonance frequency corresponding to the rotational frequency. Because remember, in the rotational case, it is the rotational frequency which generates acceleration for you. So there, if you generate, uh, let me see if I can share that thing to you. J just a second. So, yeah, so indeed the answer to your query is yes, it is possible. Let me first stop sharing this and then I can reshare again. So, yeah. so in the in the rotating case, the answer is yes, the rotating case, case you can do and uh, you will get a response like this. So let me share again. Okay. So I, I'll give you the reference as well where to look for. Yes, there was a talk recently I gave at IT Delhi. Ha, here, can you see this? Yes, yes, yes. So this is this figure. This graph is for the rotational case. The blue curve is again the spontaneous emission inside the inside the cavity. If you just put an atom inside a cavity which is not rotating, then you will see this kind of resonance profile. Near the emission, near the resonance frequency becoming equal to the energy gap of the atom, there is a huge rise in the spontaneous emission, just like we discussed. However, if you are rotating, then the component due to rotation is the orange curve. In this case, however, in rotating case, if you are familiar with the literature, you might know that the rotating case does not create particle for you. It just changes your vacuum polarization. Vacuum fluctuations appear differently, but number of particles created for rotating observer is still zero. So you still yes. do not have any stimulated component. However, spontaneous emission rate becomes different. So the net effect is the blue plus orange curve. So, but you see most of the time blue curve is some 20 orders away from the orange curve. So in the rotating case, the inertial spontaneous emission is highly favorable at most of the frequency, apart from one frequency where the resonance frequency of the cavity matches very close to the rotational frequency of the atom. There the orange curve wins over the blue curve. So around that resonance profile, the spontaneous emission happening due to rotation overtakes the spontaneous emission happening due to inertial case. So this is okay. This is the paper. The reference is this. This the third one in the list. This is the detecting accelerated enhanced vacuum fluctuation 
with atoms inside the cavity. This is for the rotational case. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, Kinchal? Uh, yeah, yes, please. So uh, the question is, uh, so I was thinking if, you know, something uh, like this can be applied to sugar effect. Uh -huh. where uh, the challenge is to produce a very high electric field. And can that be, you know, somehow sold by a you know, suitable geometry of cavity or something along that line? Uh, have you thought about it, about this? Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Uh, this, is really, also? Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a really a nice question. And yeah, so we have thought about it. And actually other people, not in terms of uh, this kind of cavity geometry, they had uh, thought, so there is a close analog of this swinger effect, something called a moving mirror kind of thing. So you, you might be familiar yeah. with that. So they, yes, yes, they, yes. they were looking at generating a fluctuations in the moving mirror artificially and try to see with one, what fluctuation. So for example, there is an oscillatory mirror. And then you have a scale in the theory, which is the oscillation scale of the theory, oscillation of, of the mirror. The moving mirror is also somewhat related to swinger effect in some scheme of things, if you look at closely. So there they were are able to argue that with some selected frequency of oscillations of this mirror, the, the moving mirror particle creation can be enhanced many folds. Now, the same kind of, we believe, I, I have not done the computation, but I have strong uh, inkling towards this fact, which you are hinting at, that once there is some background calculation, the cavity or the geometry setup brings another scale into your problem. And the density of modes, if it is suitably designed, can be made to become very large at those scales. So for example, a swinger effect again is hampered by the fact until you hit upon with very high electric field, only the low energy modes are, to, are playing in the game. And when the low energy modes are playing in the game, the same kind of problem you See, all this spontaneous emission, stimulated emission, Unruh effect, whatnot, all of these are plagued by this thing that low energy density of modes are very few. Once you arrest that, I believe all these phenomena turns alive equally well. So yes, so in principle, I do share your opinion that even the swinger effect can be tried to be put into this. But we have not done computations. I have just hunch of that. Okay, thanks. So are there any other questions? Okay, if there are uh, none, let's uh, thank Kinchal Kegin uh, for a nice talk. And uh, before I conclude, let me also on behalf of KTPI, thank uh, Sphix, uh, Sphix Center uh, for Science and Professor Sajesh for giving this uh, Zoom account to host this uh, program. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this.